Come on, let's just have fun tonight. Relax, and I just talk to you. I'm not going to, you don't have to come to the spitting row, but just come a little closer. <clears throat> Praise God. <clears throat> I'm going to receive the offering a little bit later. I want to just talk first. Um, we're, this week we're dealing with spiritual authority or authority in the church. Or when you talk about authority, then you talk about having or doing great exploits for God. You know, normally when I go to a church, I, I'm an evangelist. I love to teach. But it's not very often that a pastor gives me the liberty to come to a church and say, teach. And so this week, you know, I feel like I want to do that, you know, just teach. I, I did feel last night that there's a need here for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so maybe tonight and tomorrow night, we will be praying for that. But I am uh, continuing with, you know, uh, the authority of the believer or the authority in the church. Same thing. Psalm 78, if you'll go there. Uh, you know, here's one of those unique um, um, moments in the Bible that's wrapped up in just a couple of verses that the psalmist is mentioning about the children of Ephraim. And he says, the children of Ephraim, that's Psalm 78, verse 9 and 10. The children of Ephraim being armed, he says, they were fully armed. And they were carrying bows. They turned back in the day of battle. I mean, look at them. You know, I mean, they, they, they were taught... 365 days at Victory Church about spiritual warfare. They were equipped with the full armor of God. And when they got a chance, they did not do exploits for God, but they turned back. I see that all the time. I'm mentioning victory now just because I'm here. But remember what I said every night, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to that person next to you. <clears throat> okay? Just imagine that. Said they were fully armed. They had bows. They had everything they needed. But they turned back in the day of battle. Now, why is that? You need to... You need to um, you know, go home and go and read this. Why is that? I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because in verse 10 says, they did not, they kept not the covenant of God. And they refused to walk according to his instructions. Whoa. Everybody said, whoa. You understand? They knew. You see, the reason they turned back, because their Conscience bothered them. They were fully equipped for the battle. They had everything they needed. The only problem is they had a bad conscience. Because they knew when they would come against the enemy, chances were that God is not going to back them up. Because you understand, that's us. Everybody say, that's me. You understand, we know, you, you and I, uh, all of us know, we need God in every battle that we fight. It doesn't matter how well we're equipped. It doesn't matter, you know, how well your bank balance is. It doesn't matter how healthy you are. It doesn't matter how beautiful your wife is and how much hair your husband have. You are still going to need God every moment of every day. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. And the only way you can satisfy yourself in that is to know that you can say, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, that's one thing to quote it out of the Bible. But it's another thing when the 
enemy comes, that in the face of the enemy, you can stand and say, I don't care who comes against me. Like David against the Goliath. You know, just knowing, just knowing. You, you know it in the bottom of your heart. God is with me. You see, let me tell you something. <clears throat> a clean conscience, a clean conscience is possibly, I think, the best element that you may have in your life. Just a clean conscience. You know how you feel when uh, you have just done something that you know didn't please God. Come on, can I hear an amen? amen? And you know, man, my heart accuses me. Yes? And, and isn't that a great feeling to just close your eyes and say, Lord, I'm sorry. But you cannot keep on saying sorry for the same thing. Yes? You, you, you got to repent. What does repent mean? It says, turn... Change your mind and your purpose. It says, turn around, change your mind and your purpose. Repent means turn around. Everybody say, turn around. Change your mind and your purpose. See, you must know, and, and you must remember this tonight, that it is a great fear. Fear is a great insult in the face of God. When you fear, you're actually saying, God cannot keep me. And he can. Yes? Amen. God can. Everybody say, God can. God can. So you understand, when you're a soldier, when you're a Christian, when you're a warrior for Christ, you've got to make sure that in everything you do, you do it with all your heart, with all your might, because you have a clean conscience. And how do I have a clean conscience? By carrying out the instructions of God. Amen. And the only way you can do the instructions of God is if you can hear his voice. Remember, that's what we spoke about last night, so I'm not going to go there. You've got to be able to understand what is the download. What is God's download for this church? God has a download for this church. And once you understand the download for this church and he communicates, you know, you know God speaks not only through his word. God speaks in many ways. God speaks through his servant. God can speak in dreams. That's what Job says in, when, in slumberings on the bed. God can speak to you while you're sitting there. God speaks to you while you're working. You're busy working and you, you're doing your thing. All of a sudden, boom, God downloads something in your spirit. Once God downloads something to you, you must obey what he says. You have to obey it. Because that's why we speak of authority. If you disobey, disobedience is what? Disobedience is what? Is as rebellion. And rebellion is as what? Witchcraft. And obedience is what? Is better than? Sacrifice. See, that's how this thing works. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you speak to our hearts tonight. In the name of Jesus. Everybody say, Lord, please speak to my heart. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Boy, I spoke real late. Last night. Was that too long? Did I speak too long last night? No, great. <clears throat> you know, um, before I start ministering here uh, tonight, now that was the foundation that I laid, and I want you to remember that because everything I say now is going to be built around what I said. You know, um, if I was going to give this a title, then I would, this message a title, I would say, a living by God's promises. Hmm? Say it. Living by God's promises. Say it again. But you see, people don't do that. They only do that when it suits them. I'm not talking about you. 
But honestly, that's, what, that's the overall problem I see in the church all over. I see people staying at the same level. I, I tried to find a, a graphic here tonight that I could throw, throw up there on the screen, but I couldn't find it in time. But you know, here it is. When you have one point, or when you have a mountain like the Israelites of old, and they move around the mountain all the time. Same mountain. Same mountain. And they don't go anywhere. You know, to me, that's the, the dumbest thing. I mean, how dumb can you be and then still keep on breathing? I mean, you've got to move away from this point. Yes? Now, as I come to churches, you have no idea. Uh, I, I don't want to stand here and, and tell you about myself, but I want to tell you, God has given me great perception in the spirit realm. And I, I perceive in the spirit that you're at the point where God wants to take you to great things. Oh, come on. Can I hear a better amen? Come on, clap hands for the Lord. But to get there, I mean, to get there, you have to break away from this mountain. You have to get to a place where you say, I'm sick and tired of struggling. Find out what is God's promise. What is God saying? And then do it. Yes? Yes? You know, if you're going to go, uh, go anywhere, and you are, then your first test is going to come in the area of finances. How many of you are struggling financial? Come on, be honest. Put your hands up. Let me see. Uh, okay, so I I'm surprised it's not more than that. I hope I'm not offending, Pastor, but I... I uh, kind of asked him today, because, you know, my heart is with this church. Asked him, how's your finances? And although the finances of the church have greatly picked up, and Pastor reported very positively about that, you guys are still far. Everybody say far. far. No, no, not far. 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 So you're far beneath the level where God wants you to be. It tells me, you know, that there's something wrong here with your conscience levels. You know, you've got, to get, you've got to get to that place where you know how to give sacrificially. You know, break away from being ordinary. Come on, everybody say, I don't want to be ordinary no more. No, 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 say it with some excitement. <clears throat> You know, we, we went to Nigeria. Let me tell you something. I went to Nigeria. We started there with a church with 11 people. And that was, I think, 18 years ago. Uh, now, we're talking about uh, very, very, very poor people. Started with 11 people 18 years ago. Now, I just, I just checked today. Their membership is now running in excess of a half a million. They have, uh, they have built incredible buildings. And I mean, it's just ama amazing. And then God sent them millionaires and people with money. See, success draws success. Oh, come on. Come on, church, help me. Come on, help me. Don't let me speak alone. Come on, let me hear you agree with me. Success draws success. Yes. And so what you have to do is you have to get you. You have to position yourself. You have to move away from the mountain and say to yourself, hey, listen, we're equipped for success. Come on, say it. We're equipped for success. But move away. Hear what does God say? When you have an opportunity, obey God. I was contemplating tonight, you know, should I tell you a little bit about us? Tell you where we come from. Tell you what God has done for us. 
But then it would take it away from my time of sharing what I feel God wants me to share with you here today. You have to hear what does God say. Now, if the, if the enemy tells you you have cancer, People will come and say, I want you to pray. You know, I believe God can heal me. How many of you believe God can heal you of cancer? If you talk to them and say, I believe that God can turn your finances around. But God says this and this and that. Uh, Most people will turn away. They're like the rich man that walked away. And, you know, Jesus, when after he told him, you know, sell all your goods and go and give it out to the poor, and he went away real sad, and then Jesus told him, he lacks one thing. Isn't that terrible? Fully equipped. All the battle, all all the armor, all the weapons. But he lacks a conscience. He's not carrying out what God says. You know, I, 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 let me throw one more thing in here. Uh, a pastor in Dallas called me several years ago, and he said, a friend of mine, Jan, we're struggling financially. Uh, and they're, they're on top of a big mountain, prayer mountain. The church membership, about 350 people, good people. And uh, so I went there, he asked me to come and uh, do a weekend services. And so I go over there, I asked him, I said, how much is your tithe on a Sunday? He said, well, average is around $3,000. I said, you must be kidding me. He says, I'm not. You know, as I drove up on the mountain, around his mountain, there's acres and acres of undeveloped land in Dallas. And so, I told him, I said, brother, let me tell you something. A spirit. How many of you agree that poverty is a spirit? Come on, let me hear, let me hear you. Poverty is a spirit. No. How many of you really believe poverty is a spirit? I mean, I can show it to you here tonight. If we had a time, I'll show you. Poverty is a spirit. Because you understand, uh, poverty is, if that spirit can maintain control over this church, pastor, you cannot do what God tells you to do. You can't. Your vision will remain very small. See, Satan will control the vision of this church. But once you all get in and you hear from God, and you say, well, we're going to break loose from this thing. Then you watch what is going to happen. When you start obeying God, there's no limit. Come on, everybody say, there's no limit. Come on, say it again. One more time. No. no. Come on, say it one more time. No. I, I, told, I spoke to the church that Sunday morning, and I told them, I said, you know, spoke for 15, 20 minutes, and then I said, now, let's receive an offering. So they received an offering. And I said, now, that was a religious offering. Now, let's wait on God. I want to show you what's going to happen here when you guys release God in this community. What's going to happen here? Just watch what is going to happen. I want you to give a second offering. This one, the sacrifice offering. I want you to give as if it is the last thing you'll ever do. Give as if you know that tomorrow morning the rapture is going to definitely take place. People said. I told the pastor, no music. We just wait. We waited in dead silence for about five minutes. Somebody came. I said, now you bring your offering. Come and put it here by my feet. Then somebody else came. And all of a sudden, that thing broke loose. And a spirit of giving broke out over that church. I, I'm talking about a spirit of giving. People started taking their shoes off. They took their jewelry. 
brought jewelry, laid it down on the platform. One guy went out to his car because he didn't have any money. He went, opened the trunk of his car, got out a box of oil. That's all he had, brought a box of oil. A young man went back to his car, went and go, to go and get his basketball with an autograph of some sportsman on it, brought it to the church. We received $56,000. Come on, give God a praise offering. <laughs> but that's not it. Three weeks later, the pastor calls me. He says, Jan, you're not going to believe this. Try me. He says, the gas company just called me. They want to come and drill for gas here on this, on this hill. And they said, if we can find gas, you guys will never lack for money again. They came and put down two gas drill, drill holes. And on both of them, they found extremely abundant gas. And right now, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's just incredible how it flows. Then all of a sudden, he called me back a couple of months later. He said, they're starting to develop, you know, high dollar homes right around the place. Then President Bush called, or one of his people called, and said, uh, President Bush, living not too far from there, because uh, he's an avid bicyclist, he wants to develop this mountain into a bicycle park because he likes to bicycle. And so they developed that entire mountain into a bicycle park. And President Bush comes there. He rides his bicycle, comes to the meetings there. He's all part of it. You understand? You have no idea what happens when you start obeying God. And all of a sudden, that's now a giving church. Come on, give God a praise offering. But it's something you have to learn. Something you have to learn because, you know, the enemy is controlling. It's a spirit. It's a spirit that comes and sits over your home. And he wants to tell you, you have to take care of yourself. God cannot take care of you. Take care of yourself. And, and that's what happens. Luke 1. Go to Luke 1 if you want to. Chapter, Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, you know, Pastor, uh, Pastor Larry, you know how it is with me, and I'm sure with you it's the same thing. Uh, Derek, you know, with me, my whole life, I live every day of my life around promises. My entire life, Bill, is based on promises from God. If I want to do something, I, I, you know, I want to find out what does God say. If I had a storm, a problem, if anything goes wrong in our hearts, or I mean in our lives, our families, whatever goes wrong, you know, I, I'll, I'll go and sit and read my Bible until I find a promise from God. Sometimes I'll just ask God, Lord, please, you know, send somebody with a promise for me. Once I get a promise from God, I become unstoppable. You know, some of you, I don't know if you, if you have read my books, you know, one time I had to cross a crocodile river, crocodile infested river in the middle of the night, 10 o'clock at night. Crocodiles, not like alligators. You go in there, they're going to eat you. <laughs> you sit your foot in the water, they're going to eat you. But I had to cross on the other side. All the bridges were washed away. My accountant is right here, and, and, and I didn't tell him what I'm going to do. You know, I, I had received a promise from God. God said, you can go through that water, and no harm will come to you. And I had to swim through that river. Far, I mean, wide river. But I had received a promise from God. God said, I'll protect you. So I come here by the side of the river, and this guy's name was Rock. He said, what are you going to do? I'm going to go to the other side. He said, you, you're mad. <laughs> no, I'm not. I heard God say he's going to protect me. He says, I didn't. <laughs> well, you do whatever you want to do. I'm going over. It's in my book, you know, uh, The Naked Prisoner. Tell you what, I went through that river and... I mean, I, I, I went there early in the day, I mean, and the crocodiles were all over. Hippos. They kill more people than any other animal in the wild. And I went in that water. 
on a promise. God told me, God said, you can go. And here I am. You understand? No matter what. It's time for you to move around and move away from the mountain. Follow your Moses. If he says it can be done, if he hears from God, say, folk, God says it can be done. Then don't ask no questions. Don't follow some other person. You remember, we spoke about influences last night. You know, there's a download in this church. There's not a download for you in the church six blocks away or ten blocks away or two miles away. The download for you is right here. God is down. Now, God is downloading stuff in that church, but it's not for you. You're here. Come on, can I hear an amen? amen. And so when he, when God downloads something in your leader's life, follow what God tells you. Follow the promises of God and see what he's going to do. But keep your conscience clear. Keep the confidence of God. Keep the instructions of God. Come on, give him another praise offering. I'm going to quickly tell you this one too. My daughter, she can, I mean, you know, some people can sing. And then other people can sing. <laughs> now, my daughter can sing. Not because I'm a dad. You know, when she was in high school, you know how they do, uh, you know, you guys know how they do the high school competitions. And then they do the states, and then the states come together, and then they do the, what is it? Nationals. And then she won the nationals in Hollywood. I mean, the girl can sing. <laughs> but she had a love for God. When she sang the nationals, she wanted to know, what should I sing, Dad? Go and find out from God. She said, I already heard what he said. What did he say? She said, well, I should sing an oldie. Take my hand, precious Lord. Well, sing it. I couldn't be there, you know. I wanted to be there. My wife went there. The entire audience came to their feet, and people were crying. And then she started growing cold. Fame had gotten into her heart and her mind. And... When I saw that, you know, I, 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 uh, the Pensacola revival was going on. I, I chartered a bus, filled it up with some young people, and, and uh, put her on the bus, sent them to Pensacola. And when those young people came back, my Lord, they were all drunk in the spirit. When she got off the bus... A young man followed her that she had met there at Pensacola, and he was Lucifer's nephew. <laughs> Where's my water? <laughs> I need water now. <laughs> what do I do with my water? It was, uh, is that my water there next to you? Thank you. I'm going to take a drink now. <laughs> A long story short, I mean, he got her involved in everything you can imagine. Crack, cocaine, and I don't know what else. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Then she eloped with him. When I finally found her where she was, three months later, I went to where she was and found her as high as a kite. Oh, Lordy. almost wanted to go nuts I mean I've tried everything that young man I, I mean he was so arrogant he had done so much damage to her then I went to God that always helps doesn't it Lord Give me a promise. Give me a promise. 
God gave me 2 Corinthians 2.18. 2, that which is visible is temporal, but that which is uh, eternal is invisible. I said, what does that mean? I need, I need something better than that, Laura. No, it makes sense to me. <laughs> that which is visible is temporal. Lord, what does that mean? God said, well, here, here it is. It means if it can move in, that means it can move out. Isn't that a word for you too? No matter what's moved into your life, if it's moved in, the word for you tonight is the promise of God, it can move out. Amen. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. I, I can't tell you the whole story, but eventually this, you know, she, I, I mean, oh, Lord. I finally went to go and get her. And then he sent word to me. On Saturday, we had a family gathering. And I was, he said, because he knew my family is coming. He said, I'm coming to put a weapon on you on Saturday morning. Nine o'clock. I'm going to be there. Nine o'clock. He sent word like that. Nine o'clock. She, uh, my daughter said, Dad, you just don't know how he is. I said, honey, you just don't know how I am. <laughs> and at exactly 9 o'clock, he stopped his car over yonder. Some of my family members was all outside there, busy there with a the barbecue. He came, got out of his car, Real macho guy. Took his jacket off. You know, full of tattoos. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Took his jacket, his coat, he threw it on his, the hood of his car. Started walking towards me. <laughs> I said, his name was Jonathan. Son. I'm going to tell you two things. Don't stop. Keep on coming. <laughs> tell you two things. You've got to know this, but I want you to keep on coming. First thing you've got to know is I'm not your ordinary pastor. I'm going to slap you down, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, and the second thing you've got to know, you are here in answer to prayer I've been wanting you so bad. <laughs> he came there, you know, my, I told my family, stay one side. And my wife, oh, honey, please, honey, stay one side. <laughs> he came, I mean, you know, when he, when he approached me, he, he took a stance and then he took a swipe. I'm telling you, I mean, it's the easiest thing for me to miss that swipe. I mean, just lean back. And when he missed, I'm telling you, I laid his flat hand on his ear. And I'm telling you, I knocked him down. He went down into convulsions. My, da my daughter said, Dad, you killed him. I said, no, his kind don't die that quick. <laughs> That was the end of him. <laughs> well, you understand, what I'm saying is, you know, and I just told you that because I like telling that one. <laughs> <laughs> you have to fight the fight that you have to fight by the promise God gives you. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's sickness, if it's finances, if it's in your marriage, if it's in the family. Find out what does God say. Because you are a soldier, men and women. With God, there's neither male nor female. You're in, 
You're in the army of God. God wants to take this church to a place where people can look up and say, that church, you've got the right name, Victory. Live up to it. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, somebody shout for him. Glory to God. You understand? Let me tell you something. Any area of your life, Say this, say any area of my life that is not influenced by hope is under the influence of a lie. If you don't have hope, then you're living under a lie. You're getting up in the morning and I mean you don't have no hope. You get your paycheck and you don't know what you're going to do. Because you live in fear all the time. And you sit in church and when, it, when God speaks to you about doing something, you're too afraid to obey him. You live under a lie. You know, you know how you get hope? You know how you get hope? Find a promise from God. Hmm? You want hope? Find a promise from God. See, that's what covenant was to those people. See, the covenant of God with his people is what gave them hope. God said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Glory to God. Okay, now let me just switch gears a little bit. Am I still okay? <clears throat> Do you understand? I, I always tell people, uh, we, we, we speculated a little bit about some philosophy today. Let me just take you into a little bit of my philosophy. Actually, biblical philosophy this time. Where do you think your spirit comes from? Come on, talk. So, does that mean? Well, let's take Ecclesiastes three. You really, I mean, you really gotta uh, uh, read these things yourself. If you have your Bible, read them, because you have to underline them. Or if you have an electronic Bible, highlight it. This is a good one. I'm gonna give you something good. Put it on the wall, will you, uh, Brandon? Is Brandon still there? See, we were talking today about some of these things, and we were just, you know, speculating a little bit. I'm not going to go there. But we have to understand that what is happening to you, what is fiction to happen to Victory Church in the eyes of God has already happened. All you have to do Get rid of fear. Develop a clean conscience. Develop obedience. Follow God. Find a promise. Hear what is he saying. And then see that which has already happened will now in the New Testament they have that word manifest. Hmm? Somebody said, that's powerful. You see, God is just waiting on you. He's not waiting on time. He's not waiting on circumstances. He's not waiting for uh, the right moment. He's just waiting for you. Yes? Are you learning? Let me throw another verse at you quickly. That will really substantiate this. Genesis 2. Let's go verse 4. Genesis 2 and verse 4 and 5. Um, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. Maybe sometime we can talk about the heavens. 
This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. We have our own heaven. This earth has its own heaven. There's other heavens. Look at the next verse. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. Now, I, I, I don't like that. Look at, look at the King James one. I'll just do that. So, it says, who's got another translation? Anybody has it? Oh, man, that's as bad. Nobody has a proper Bible. Yeah, that's good. Can you read verse 5 for me? Okay, uh, let's go back a little bit. Go, let's go to the latter part of verse 4. Um, yes, uh, read, read it as if it's the same verse in verse 5. Do that again and read it together. Okay, okay. She, uh, I should read like this. And the day that God made the earth and the heaven, and then the King James says, and every plant... So he made the earth, and he made heaven, and he made what? Verse 5, every plant. Okay, what? Okay, so, so what it says, he said he made earth, heaven, and every plant. He made every plant before it grew. And then he goes on, and he made every What? Yes, before, before it grew. He made it before it was. You have to understand, are you getting this? God made it before it was. So why was it not visible? Read the rest of verse 5. Okay, stop. So it did not manifest yet. Because it did not yet rain. Why did it not yet rain? Carry on. And there was no man because there was no man. See, that's the pattern of everything. God has it made. Say, God has it made. Look at your, na- look at your wife, your family member, or whoever. Say, honey, God has our answer. No, no, no. Say it. No, no, no. No, say it. Don't smile when you say it. Say it and let that promise hit you in your inner man. Say, God has my answer. All you have to do is show up. All you have to do is obey. All you have to do is clean up your conscience. Keep the instructions of God. God tells you to do something. Don't ask why. Don't ask, you know, you know, you know, I cannot do it. God will tell you, get out of here, you sick thing. <laughs> See, God continuously says to us, do not fear. Do not fear. Come on, say it. Do, do not, not fear. fear. Luke 1. I'm going to read a long verse quickly for you. We still okay with time, Pastor? Okay. Um, well, actually, before I go to Luke 1, sorry. Uh, uh, let, me, let me give you another verse which I think, you know, substantiates this. You remember what God spoke to Jeremiah, Derek, in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, you remember? No. <laughs> God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I what? I called you. Whoa. Just think about that. God speaks to Jeremiah, and it's not like Jeremiah was unique. That's just the way it is with God. You remember? That which is has already been, and that which will be has already happened. 
Now God speaks to Jeremiah. Before you were in your mother's womb, I called you. Now I'm going to go into some Jan Winter philosophy. Yeah, let me tell you something. That tells me that before Jeremiah went into his mother's womb, the spirit of Jeremiah was there around the throne of God, and God had discussions with him. Now, Jeremiah, this is what I'm going to do to you, and this is what I'm going to do with you. This is how I'm going to use you. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you into earth. When I send you into earth, no one can go into earth except through the gate. See, the woman is the earth gate. No one can come into earth except through a woman. And so, I'm going to send you into the earth. Now, the moment you go into or through the earth gate, your memory, Jeremiah, will be wiped. And from there on, you'll have to rely on the impulses of my spirit. Now, everything has already been decided here around the throne room. All you have to do now, as soon as you develop any senses, I want you to understand, you and I already have a covenant. Boy, is that powerful or what? You understand, as you sit here today, do you realize that before you were you, God already knew what was going to be the outcome of your life. God already knew it. And so all he does is coming into the mother's womb, through the mother's womb. See, a lot of people say, I'm from my father and from my mother. You know, that's why a lot of Christians say, well, you know, I have a family curse on me. I'm, listen, man, you're not from your father and your mother. You've just come through your mother and your father. You're from God. Amen. Come on, say, I'm from God. Amen. Come on, somebody shout for him. Oh. oh, my God. Somebody shout for him. Glory to God. You understand? That should change the way you, you talk about yourself. I am from God. And all you have to do is then find your way into the promises of God. See, Jesus found his way into the promises of God. Let's get that. Luke 1. Okay? Uh, let me go there to the Bible here. Uh, now, I'm going to quickly read this to you. You remember, the angel comes to Mary. Mary... Here it is. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary. She's 13 years old. Some say she was 11. But whatever it was, she was a young little girl. She was betrothed. That means she was promised to a man. And the angel Gabriel comes to her, and he's sent, sent to the city of, of Galilee to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. And... Uh, Having come in, verse 28, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Uh, in English, it doesn't come out. You know, I have, I have an advantage over most of you because I speak other languages. I can, I can read the Bible in so many languages. In other languages, it's, it reads it like this. Hello, Mary. <laughs> the Lord likes you. And he has granted you an extra measure of grace. <laughs> and then some people would say, Oh, glory to God. <laughs> but not her. She says in verse 29, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. With other words, what's coming? Why am I going to need extra grace? Why is one portion not enough? And so he starts talking to her. He says in verse 31, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son 
and she'll call his name Jesus. Jesus. He'll be great. Hmm? Where's that come from? Where's that come from? That comes from the throne room. Where's Gabriel come from? He comes from the throne room. This is a promise from God. Say it. Say, this is a promise. He says, he'll be great. And he'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary said, how can this be since I don't know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power. Promise! And uh, he says in verse 38, then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Better English. She said, Behold, the slave of the Lord. That's what it meant, maidservant, slave. How will this be? He comes and he comes with all these powerful promises. And he says, she says, how will this be? And he tells her, and then she says, I make myself the slave of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to thy word. Hmm? Somebody say, that's powerful. powerful. See, at that moment, she emptied herself. Can you imagine, 13 years old? Quickly, let me throw this in. 13 years old, 11 years old, however. Can you imagine her going to her mom after the angel leaves? Now, there's no presence. There's no more anointing. You are in the revival service, and God spoke to you great things. God told you to give $1,000 in the offering. Now you go home. You don't feel the anointing. And you start to wonder, did I do the right thing? She comes to her mother. Can you see her? Can you see her standing there by her mother? Pretty nervous. Mother says, Mary, don't you have anything to do? Well, yeah, mom. Have you done your chores? Not all of them, mom. I got to talk to you about some stuff. Well, come on, get it over and done with. You know, you got to get, your dad will be here soon. You know, you got to get your chores done. What's going on? Mom, you don't got to believe this. What is it, Mary? I'm pregnant. <laughs> can you imagine, can you just imagine what happened next? You know, it's not like today. You know, those days they could get stoned. I don't mean get drunk. I mean stoned. <laughs> can, can you see her mother? Just, I mean, just catching a dizzy fit. And then saying, bring my anxiety pills. <laughs> and then she says, you know that your dad is going to kill Joseph, don't you? Mom, that's the part you won't believe. It's not Joseph. <laughs> Mary, who is it? I'm telling you right now, your dad's going to kill him. Your dad's going to kill him. Mama, promise me you're not going to get mad at me. Who is it, Mary? Tell me right now. Tell me before you take your head off. Who is it? Mama, it's God. God made me pregnant. Do you think for one moment her mom believed her? Come on. Do you think your mama would have believed you if you said, I, you know, I believe eventually, you know, they talked it out and she told the story. And, but 
You think the rest of Nazareth ever believed her? Hmm? No. That's why Jesus never could perform a miracle there. That's why in those days she went to Elizabeth. And that's enough of this. But that's why when she was yet in the presence of God, she emptied herself. See, that's where authority comes from. That's where obedience comes from. Because other people are going to question you. You see, here's the thing. Have you ever noticed that when somebody gets newly saved and they trust God, you know, and they write out a check for $100? I mean, sometimes before they leave the church, God gives them $100 back. Quick. You've been serving God for a long time now. You do it. I mean, it might take months before you get that $100 back. Not necessarily. I'm just saying, you know, that's sometimes the way it works with me. Because God wants to test your obedience. Yes? Yeah. I'm using money, you know, because it's so close to us. We're on the battlefield, folk. You're battling sicknesses. You're battling drugs. You're battling children with rebellion. You're battling broken homes. You're battling all sorts of struggles out there. You're at war. Come on, say it. We're at war. We're at war. You better hear tonight when God speaks to you. I'm almost done. You better tonight empty yourself and say, Lord, whatever you say, let it be to me according to thy word. How can I empty myself? I can only empty myself based on a promise from God. He said, my baby is going to become the king of kings. Amen. You know, when I was 12 years old, God called me for the ministry. Long story, I don't have time for that. It was so incredible. It was for half an hour. God played off. I'm not kidding you. God played a mo- like a movie off in front of me. When I was 12 years old. God called me in an audible voice, ran to my dad's room, thought it was him. He said, no, I didn't call you. He was half drunk. And so I went back to my room, spoke my name a second time. I I ran back to my dad's house, uh, room. I was so scared. Then my dad realized what was going on. Actually, he did, my mom did. She was saved. And she told him, get a Bible, read to him. Read to me 1 Samuel 3. And then... Uh, you know, told me what happened to Samuel. And he said, go back to your room. And God shows up again. Just go kneel down and say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And I went back to my room. Didn't know God then. I wasn't saved. And God came back in that room, turned my life around. And for a half an hour, God played my life off like that. It was so incredible. I saw myself standing, preaching, to crouch that was further than the eyes could see. I'll show you tomorrow night. I'll, I'll try. Maybe Daniel will help me. we get that ready tomorrow night. Just show you some clips. Crowds of over a million at a time. Saw miracles of people coming out of wheelchairs, blind eyes open. I saw it at the age of 12. Next day, my dad wanted to know, did God show up? Yes, sir. Then he wanted to know, what did he say? I couldn't tell him because he's unsaved. I knew he, would, he wouldn't understand. So I just told him, I think God likes me. <laughs> Can you sit here today and, and say to the person next to you, without lying, I know God likes me. Can you do that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell somebody. Of course he likes you. People say, God loves me. He doesn't just like me. Big difference. How many of you love your children? Let me see you. Oh, your parents. Whatever. Put them real high. Let me see them real high. Put them down. 
how many of you sometimes don't like them? <laughs> you know, big difference. You know, you can love them, but sometimes you don't like them. Let me close. It's time to move up, church. Say it. It's time to move up. It's time to empty yourself based on God's promises. You're in at war. You have the armor of God. Pastor been teaching you about the armor of God. The leadership have been teaching you on these things. You have it. You have many promises of God. I am your healer. Come on, let me hear some amens. Amen. I will never leave you, never forsake you. Amen. I will open up the windows of heaven and I will pour out a blessing upon you that you cannot contain. Amen. I mean, it can go on and on and on. He says, whatsoever you ask in my name, believing you will receive them. See, I mean, I can go on and on and on. You have a promise. Stop living hopeless. But bring yourself into a place where you say, Pastor Larry, I want to be part of this army. I want you, listen here, and I close with this. Well, this is one of my closings. <laughs> you want to say, Pastor Larry, I want you to teach me obedience. Can you do that? Without, without just saying it with the lips, can you speak to Pastor Larry out loud, even though he may not distinguish your voice, everybody out together at the same time, just loud as you can, Pastor Larry, teach me obedience. Come on, everybody together. Because that's what it's all about, folks. Authority, obedience. Ephraim was armed to the teeth, but they turned away from the battle because they did not keep the covenant of God, neither did they obey his laws. Yes. I was still going to talk to you about Jesus, you know, and, and what happened before and then after he came through Mary and then how he had to find himself. But we'll keep that for another day. Here, that's enough. Put your hand in your heart. Let me pray you, while you have your hand in your heart. Father, I want to pray here today that based on so many promises, That you've given us. I want to pray that you would help them to believe you no matter what. In spite of all the cynics out there, in spite of the whisper of the enemy that may say this or thus, will you help us to hear freshly tonight your promise? For their situation. And then help them to obey. They have the weaponry. But Lord how many times. How many more times will they turn away from the battle. And I ask you today oh God. Take this church to the next level. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stand with me, will you? I want you to, while every eye is closed tonight, I'd like to have every eye closed because this is very private. I just want you. Nobody looking around now. Just you. Now I'm talking to you. With every eye closed, if you say, God, I want you to clean my conscience of whatever, 
I want to ask God to just remove guilt from you. And just ask God, Lord, just remove guilt and clean my conscience. Some of you haven't been paying your full tithe like you're supposed to. That gives you a bad conscience. Trust God. As of today, you trust God. As of today, come Sunday, I'm going to write out my check for my full tithe. And this will be from now on until Jesus comes. I will not break covenant with the Lord. We're going to go up. We're not going down. We're going forward. We're not going backwards. Whatever has given you a guilt complex or you have no peace with God, I want you to break with it. If it's sin, whatever it is, then I want you, if you say, Lord, I need a, a clean conscience, nobody looking around, then put your hand up. I want to pray for you. Just put your hand up real high and let's pray. My Father, you see those hands. These are your children. These are warriors. We need them. We need them as soldiers. We need them, oh Lord, to stay absolutely in line. Will you please, Lord, tonight, remove from them guilt. They're equipped. You've equipped them, Lord. I pray that you ready them as of tonight to carry out that which you have instructed them for, that which you have predestined them for. 